Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy is sponsored by Thomson Reuters, providing legal professionals with the intelligence, technology, and human expertise they need to find trusted answers. Products include Westlaw, Practical Law, and Firm Central legal practice management software for small law firms. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Online at ThomsonReuters.com. Access to Democracy is made possible in part by a donation from Firefly Credit Union. Firefly is the new name of U.S. Federal Credit Union, which has proudly served the financial needs of the Greater Twin Cities community since 1925. At Firefly, we guide our members forward and give them the power to chase dreams by delivering the financial solutions they need to get ahead. From checking accounts to mortgages, we'll light the way. We are Firefly Credit Union, and this is Life Illuminated and Dr. Charles Crutchfield of award-winning Crutchfield Dermatology in Egan, acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. A Minnesota native who trained at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Crutchfield personally treats all patients and states that experience counts and quality matters. Crutchfield Dermatology, look good, feel great, with beautiful skin. Welcome. Access to Democracy returns. We have two return guests, uh, two very prominent professors from Inverhills Community College and good friends, Professor Richard Jewell to my immediate left and Professor Zach Sullivan on the end there. And uh, it's really a great time to talk about higher education or problems in higher education and I spent six years at Inverhills also, six really nice years teaching there, uh, a Holocaust course. But as I look at the curriculum now, seem to be a lot less courses being offered. Uh, so maybe you can address that. Be my guest. We've had something like a 30% <clears throat> loss. Um, of students. This is happening throughout the state in the two-year colleges and I assume at the universities as well. And so we've had to, uh, we don't have as many students for courses and we've had to cut back on sections. And faculty also? We are certainly uh, cutting back on faculty. We have uh, um, a lot fewer adjuncts than we used to. And uh, maybe Zach can speak to um, the loss of some of our full-time professors, too. Yeah, I think it, at Inverhills and across the system, well, at Inverhills in particular, we um, have several people that are on layoff, um, and we'll have to see how that goes. That the, uh, once the layoff process is start, the administration has that year to pull back from that uh, decision. So some of it's about these broader trends. I mean, uh, higher education, during the Great Recession, there was a lot of people returning uh, for more training and that sort of thing, and that's a pretty typical uh, situation where higher education tends to run in counter-cyclical trends with regard to the economy. Um, so that's part the, of the story. The economy gets better. And the then economy people gets go better, people get go back to work. And the, when the economy does not improve or the, the economy stagnates, people have a tendency to go back to school. So, you know, that's a very real... Uh, a trend, but there's also a broader discussion, right, about sort of the value of a liberal arts education, to what extent should be, we be much more narrowly focused on career training, um, vocational training uh, at our two-year institutions, and to what extent should we uh, continue to invest in our, our liberal, art, liberal arts curriculum, and, and that's very much in question right now. And I think that carries over to four-year colleges mm -hmm. as well, from what I see. <clears throat> I just see a diminution of what I consider very important things, social sciences, humanities, uh, civics type courses that 
I think are really foundational for students that we're not emphasizing anymore. And uh, in having connection with some of my former students and others uh, through writing and other things, uh, they can't spell, they can't write, they don't know history. I watch Jeopardy in the afternoons and see the response of very bright students to history questions and it's almost a non-response in many cases. So, Don't we lose something really important when we lose that in our education? You know, Alan, I teach um, an Introduction to Humanities course mm -hmm. and uh, students come into the course, often they will tell me later after they're comfortable talking with me, uh, they, they come into the course often thinking that this is uh, more interesting than a lot of other things they could take. Uh, it's the least worst choice for them uh, because they have to take something in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and they're kind of interested in medieval knights or in the Greek myths and things like that. So they take the course, but they discover that the course opens them up to a whole new understanding of uh, who and what we are as a society, as a civilization, historically, culturally, what it means to be a society, and, uh, and I'm sure that history classes work like this when they're well taught too. It's, I think it's important for us to have an ed educated citizenry that we have liberal arts courses. And students will tell me at the end of the humanities course that they suddenly understand what the liberal arts are all about. And I tell them that basically what they've had in one semester in a humanities course is uh, knowledge about the whole liberal arts curriculum that uh, makes them understand, as most four-year college graduates do, what it really means uh, to have a society and a culture. And that's very important. I know you do a lot of work, Zach, uh, with politics and mm -hmm. government. So <clears throat> how does that translate to your students? Well, I think that's the, <clears throat> there's so many ways to look at education. And I think some of the students that we deal with, policymakers that uh, um, create public policy around education, we all look at the role of education different, but we can see some certain trend lines, you know. So is the point of higher education and form citizenry and, and making better uh, decisions and understanding our institutions and how to participate within those institutions. That's kind of the John Dewey approach, democracy, education for the sake of a, a stronger democracy. Um, some people see it as, again, more vocationally driven as an individual benefit for people. That is to say, I will go invest and I want return on that investment at an individual level. Is there a collective um, responsibility here. So are we investing in the state of Minnesota, in the, in the future of Minnesota, in, a, in an informed citizenry? Is it an individual benefit? Is it a collective benefit? Is it some combination of those two? So this is the big debate that we're having. Um, and I, you know, just to follow up on Richard's point, I think that there's a fair number of students who, uh, that we inter interact with that are much more focused on education as an individual prospect and as about their much more narrow career goals and objectives as opposed to um, looking at it like I need to uh, learn to write, analyze, uh, read, uh, speak at a high level and I'm getting this broad education to do that. Uh, I think there's a fair amount of folks that perhaps don't pursue it uh, th that approach but rather what do I need to do specifically to get the specific vocational degree I'm looking for. They want to learn to write, but sometimes they spell it R-I-T-E. <laughs> and uh, uh, that tells us we're, we're failing someplace. More this and notion that education's all... a luxury, you know, that the, that the liberal arts are a luxury that, 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 that <clears throat> they don't, shouldn't have, or, or that it's something that we can't afford and that we need to get going down the path of being whatever we're gonna be. But the interesting thing is we don't know what we're going to be. Our careers are going to change five or six times over the course of our lives. And so it's much better to have that foundation that is much more adaptable, at least in my perspective. Well, look what's happened to our nation in a matter of weeks mm -hmm. in terms of the Obama government gone, uh, the Trump government or uh, whoever is running it here. 
And I think that he plans, by the way, to teach humanities after his term as president, mm. but because uh, he's so conversant with it. But there's also a lot of bureaucracy involved in higher education mm -hmm. today. And I think that that takes away, to a large degree, some of the time that could be better spent by the faculty uh, or needs to be spent by the faculty in terms of not filling out forms and meeting certain standardized tests and things like that, but rather in teaching. And mm -hmm. I know you two both have great reputations with your students, but that's not true of everybody. <clears throat> And uh, you know, I, I used to think that uh, it was true of me when I was teaching also, mm -hmm. until they ran me off with a, with a pole. But uh, you had a very you always filled your classes out. My class is always overfilled. But yes, that's because students really didn't know much about the Holocaust, which we broadened to 20th century genocide, mm -hmm. and you know talk about 1915 talk about 1933 in Russia, uh, what happened to the Kurds, uh, who are the Kurds today in 1915, uh, World War I, that was the war to end all wars, if you remember, uh, not. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they really related to it and they enjoyed it and we used uh, a lot of motion pictures in the course, which they really related to also. I mean, we did some unique things. I, for a midterm, as you will recall, I uh, gave them the option of answering two essay questions or spending a weekend wearing a yellow Jewish star on their outer garment right. and going around and recording the reactions of family, friends, and others. And we got some just incredible results from that. Mm -hmm. So One of the problems today is that <clears throat> people forget the dictum uh, especially, especially the way our government is going nationally. Um, we forget the dictum that those who don't know their history uh, are doomed to repeat it. We learn from the liberal arts. We learn from our history and from our previous cultures to be better. And if we don't have a good number of people who remember that as citizens, then we are doomed to repeat the same failures that have happened in the past. It's been the strength, too, of the United States. I mean, the liberal arts university or the liberal arts college is an American invention that began here. And, you know, the institutions, to the degree that they exist throughout Europe and elsewhere, um, at least in the Western world, were much more about training clergy or religiously associated. And so folks like Jefferson's, folks like Franklin, they understand the importance of having a liberal arts experience um, to creating a citizenry that could, that could make decisions for itself. And, um, and so I, I do fear that stepping away from that too because it does harm our ability to make good collective decisions, as you mentioned. And how much does the social society aspect of things, uh, <clears throat> uh, I heard something yesterday about Spotify mm -hmm. and I turned mm -hmm. to Sharon and I said, what's Spotify? I mean, you know, uh, we all have cell phones <laughs> and uh, uh, a lot of people can text. You know that because of the st statistics of fatal automobile accidents, mm -hmm. which hit uh, a really a high last year. But how much does that play in increasing education or diminishing education? The social media, yeah. every new innovation in technology expands something. And the expansion that some of the expansions that occur in the new social media of very different kinds than just simply email or even just simply websites, uh, one of the expansions is that people try to mimic uh, the way newscasters have worked for so many decades by offering information and then supporting it with facts. But the problem is that the facts they support it with are not researched usually in social media. They're just simply laid out there in quick fashion because they're almost a form of gossip. Another type of expansion is the existence of gossip. You can gossip 24-7 unless you want to sleep um, on the new social media, whereas, you know, I grew up in a country area, a small town. 
You had to go visit people and have coffee with them to gossip. That might be several times a week. You're talking about having a dialogue, and, mm -hmm. and people don't have dialogues with each other anymore. Yeah. It's uh, different. Certainly isn't not it? the way uh, I, you know, I grew up also. Mm -hmm. It's more of an anonymous dialogue, which you know, has its downside. But and I think the other real issue there is that confirmation bias that people tend to fall into when it comes to online information sources. That is, they seek out those. Uh, those forms of information that, that confirm what they already believe and they, you know, uh, set aside um, those that do not. And that's a real problem. I, mean, I would argue, you know, in the current media landscape, there's better stuff than ever before. Mm -hmm. There's also worse stuff than ever before. Yeah. There's just a lot more of everything than there's <clears> ever been before. And now the struggle is with our students is how do we give them the skill set to be able to figure out what's what. What's, what's well-resourced, what's well-researched, and what is uh, a complete fabrication that is meant uh, to grind an axe. And, and that's, that's where the humanities, thing. I think, really sure. comes <clears throat> into play mm -hmm. and is really important. Mm -hmm. Because you have your choice today. You have facts, and you can substantiate them, or you have alternative facts, mm -hmm. which you can make up as you go along, and we see that from the highest echelons of mm -hmm. our government right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it, that's pretty scary. There's too. facts and there's also context, and I think that's another <laughs> thing that the liberal arts brings. So when you're broadly trained, or trained across the liberal arts, you can, there's cross information and you can provide that kind of historical context or economic context or whatever the situation is. And I sense too that there's a great loss of that as well, putting those facts into a specific historical or cultural context. That's hard. And it's so easy to give misinformation mm -hmm and have it go viral. Uh, and we see that almost every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, that too is pretty frightening. And that's me. dividing in the society because there's a fair number of us <laughs> that, um, and I put myself into that camp, that, that do try to look at this stuff methodically. And I think um, the two of you do as well. And I think that there are a fair number of folks who, for a diversity of cultural and other reasons, either don't have those skills or just really don't want to hear it. I mean, I think of that particularly in this last campaign where folks in rural America and Appalachia and coal mining country really want to hear that that coal mine is going to open back up like it was in 1960, but it's not going to. And if it does, it's going to be mechanized, modernized, and they're not going to hire the same folks to do the same work that they once did. And that's a really tough thing because, uh, you know, it, it creates a real division in the society of people really wanting something to be true so bad that they'll believe anything. And what happens is they will end up voting against their own interests in the long run uh, because somebody comes across mm -hmm. brasher or more promising or even if, if they know that this person is certainly of a low moral character, they will vote for him or her uh, simply because they think it's going to help them in the long run. And just as you said, mm -hmm. that's completely fallacious. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I think most society, most of us in this country, most people in any society believe that they are rational beings. In actual fact, so much of everything we do and think and say has some kind of emotional or, or feeling basis as well. Mm -hmm. And there are some of us who believe that we have to be very careful if we are going to try to understand actual facts and actual needs that try to do so in spite of our emotions at times. And there are a lot of people on the other hand, and I think this has been demonstrated, it is demonstrated in almost every uh, big or small election that we have, their emotions tend to guide their thinking. They feel first and then they try to find the facts to fill in reasons mm -hmm. to support that feeling. Yeah. And, and that's a really good point. I want to make <coughs> sure that, you know, with, with my comments, that it's not to say that someone could get beyond this and become sort of a cyborg and, and uh, uh, perceive the world right. exactly as it is. Right. But you need to be conscious of those very human biases that we all have. And all of us want to hear what we want to hear. Yeah. Now, the question is, how do we hold ourselves accountable to that? You know, and speaking to what you mentioned earlier about, um, in some cases, voting against your own rational interests, I think about 
the Affordable Care Act in particular. I mean, there's so much discussion about the, um, the marketplaces for buying mm -hmm. health care, but the largest part of the expansion of the Affordable Care Act was expanding who could get Medicaid health care for the poor. And they changed it from the poverty line to 133% of the poverty line. And so, so many folks in these districts that were um, uh, very supportive of President Trump ended up uh, being part of this health care expansion. And if the Affordable Care Act <clears throat> is truly overturned in its existing form, those folks who are between poverty and that 133% of poverty, they'll lose their health care. And you're talking about 12 million people, yeah. I think, that I, that I heard. It's a big uh, chunk of those yeah. folks covered, you know. Yeah. Interesting thing to me, talking about people being informed, is that 30% of the population in one article that I read, and again, I haven't researched mm -hmm. it, so on, people said, I don't care. Get rid of Obamacare because then I'll be covered under the Affordable Care Act. Sure. And they didn't know that they are one in the same, one a name given to it and one the official name. Uh, there is little protection for, for that kind of ignorance. Absolutely, yeah. People don't recognize mm -hmm. that being covered, and there's families plan up to 26 as part of that, the expansion of Medicaid. You know, all the components that are there, and so also when you pull people individually on those provisions, um, they express support for those individual pr provisions. So then when you really nail it down, you have people have problems with those state exchanges or the national exchange. That's a matter of improving and reforming as opposed to a matter of a wholesale departure. And I think that's actually where we're going to end up. They're going to call it a repeal and replace. But I honestly think it'd be political suicide to go back and reconsider all these things because you're exactly right. People people have not yet figured out that they're actually in support of many components of the Health Care Act. And, uh, you know, that's just another aspect, scary mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. of our society uh, to me. Mm -hmm. Now, getting, getting back to uh, <clears throat> higher education, of course, uh, back in the days when Cheryl Frank was the president at Inver Hills, there was a great... Uh, really a conciliatory attitude between the faculty union and the administration. And I saw that dissipate in the years that I was there. And uh, yeah, typically the community colleges, when they were started several decades ago, were perceived mm -hmm. uh, in many places as uh, administrators and faculty and staff members all working together to help each other create a strong educational program for two-year students. But that has gradually shifted. On some campuses it has remained, on other campuses uh, there has been uh, an attitude among uh, high administrators on that campus that they should run everything because they are the bosses. And what we've seen, uh, from the messages coming from uh, higher administration at the Minnesota State offices, which used to be called the, the Minsku offices, uh, is that the bosses should run everything. And this has been true for the last five years or so. Uh, Rather than the educators set their own path in their departments. Yes, things are no longer collaborative <clears throat> like they used to be. And the presidents on each campus, whatever they personally believe, have been uh, forced on each uh, Minnesota State campus to uh, tell the campus what the higher, <coughs> excuse me, administration in St. Paul is saying has to be done. And another thing uh, to me is money that is wasted on the higher level, the administrative level. And you just pointed out, we are now Minnesota State. We used to be Minsku. Uh, I believe that a half a million dollars was spent with a search group to look for a new name. You know, lock two mm -hmm. people in a room for 10 minutes and you could come up with a new name. And we've seen that in these searches time and again, where so much is wasted that could be put into education. Well, this happens across the system in a number of small ways, especially as there's less collaboration among the different people on campus. On our campus, we had uh, an outside expert come in to help us 
determine what the campus climate was and how to make it better. And she seemed like a very good person. She seemed to know what she was doing, and we spent 100000 on her. Um, but it all came to naught because the administration would not follow what were her recommendations and the recommendations of the faculty. And th thus you get the battles with the union and the faculty, and you had one really serious example there where uh, it seems that people who are the grievance officers of the union are the first ones who seem to uh, get axed. But you had one right there where the grievance officer of the union was forbidden to enter the campus, uh, requiring a lot of money and a court battle, and he was reinstated. At With the end little of it. explanation. Mm -hmm. Either way, as to why he was gone and why he's back. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it does, it does go in sharp contrast to, I've served as a grievance rep before at a time that the institution was more collegial and um, we never got to a point where we were at those kind of situations. So, um, you know, it, I don't know what it is. I mean, we can explore it, but there's some degree of a perfect storm here of, of, of a different uh, leadership perspective at the Minnesota state level. And then also it is true that we have fewer students that are seeking to attend our institution. So it's kind of like that old adage that, uh, you know, when, when there's less water, the animals get meaner, you know, a little bit. And, and, and at that time, uh, you really need excellent leadership to see and your the, way and through the pressure those is on mm -hmm. to do more with less. Yeah. And sometimes you can't do more with less without a little help. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's really in terms of someone who's no longer mm -hmm. teaching, at least at a university or a college, it's very depressing. So it goes all the way to the state as well. I mean, the mm -hmm. uh, Minnesota State was uh, pretty severely underfunded last year at the same time that the uh, state instituted a tuition freeze, and that's wonderful for students, and we don't want them to pay any more than they have to, but um, the state also has to then come in and fund. And then, of course, when you do read stories in the newspaper about perhaps uh, money that could be used better, uh, that certainly doesn't create the political pressure to provide additional funding for the Minnesota state system. So, you know, I want it adequately funded, uh, but we also have to be very good stewards of those resources as we, uh, as we request it. This is a discussion that we can really carry on, and I hope we will, actually, uh, in the future. We're down to the last minute. So uh, in terms of, of looking at college today, why don't you both encapsulate your responses as to where we are and where we're going. I think in Minnesota we're, in spite of the lack of funding, we're <clears throat> still doing better than they are in some states. On the other hand, the funding, uh, we, we no longer have a situation in which Garrison Keeler's every child uh, above average is, uh, is the case anymore. Uh, we have the case of education in our state, the pay levels, um, number of functions, we're only average now. And that's gonna, and we're gonna go further down. Yeah, and I think I had my say before, but mm -hmm. I, I, I think the political culture has been historically strong for higher education, but we need to, we need to continue to invest. Richard Jewell, Zach Sullivan, as usual, thank you very much. Thank and you. to be continued. Thank you. Thanks. Ha, 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 ha.